All right, all righty. Um, yeah, um, I think we can get started. Okay, welcome everyone. Really wonderful to see you all, at least your names. And later on, we expect we'll be hearing from you. Um, I am B. Ruby Rich. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the editor of Film Quarterly and uh, very proudly the co-editor uh, with Joao Luis Vieira of this special dossier on the new Brazilian cinema and this moment in Brazilian film. Uh, we began working on this um, back in 2019 in earnest, but we've been talking about it for some time um, and really wanted to mark a moment of a great flowering of Brazilian film, unaware um, at first that we were going to be marking also a moment of the attacks on it um, uh, in the era of Bolsonarismo. So we've been through quite a ride with this section and we have wonderful contributors who've joined us on it. Um, it's going to be a, a really wonderful session today, I think. Um, I also want to mention that in addition to the dossier, which by the way, uh, the University of California Press has wonderfully made free for everyone uh, from now until the end of February and into early March. Um, and so please feel free to download the articles, share them and um, build them into curriculum or into your leisure time because um, it's, it's just a wonderful set of pieces. Um, but also in addition to that, um, BAM PFA, the Pacific Film Archive has created a special program, a special spotlight on Brazilian film. Here it is, uh, the new Brazilian cinema. And while it is not free, it is wildly, widely available for anyone who wants to sign up and buy a ticket and see it. And um, they've been very thrilled to discover these films through our writers and to be able to offer some of them for the first time to American audiences. Um, in some cases, that's involved subtitling, and they also are doing some interviews with the filmmakers to round out that offering. So thanks to Kate McKay and Kathy Garrett and everyone at BAM PFA for this collaboration. Um, and of course, we have to thank um, uh, the Ford Foundation and Just Films, which has been supporting uh, the work of Film Quarterly and these new initiatives, the translation translations, uh, these webinars, and these kinds of tie-ins uh, that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise as a journal. So we're incredibly fortunate, and we're very fortunate to have your attention uh, for this today. So that said, um, I'm going to turn the floor over to Joao so that he can kind of ground you in um, our shared sense of this moment. And then we will go on and introduce you uh, one by one to our different participants and you'll get to hear from them. I will just explain to you the way we're running this. Everyone will speak for three to five minutes, including Joao and myself. Then we will have some crosstalk among us, a dialogue where we can explore some of the things that have been said. And then the final half hour, we want to hear from you. And we'll be taking up your uh, questions in the chat and in the Q&A. So um, with that, uh, Joao, I'm turning over to you. And um, lovely uh, to have you here with me for this uh, actual uh, final uh, fruition of all this work that we embarked on so long ago. Joao. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Ruby. Thanks, everyone, for being here. And I'd like to begin with um, uh, just saying that I'm very happy that I see here the names. I don't see them, actually, the images, but I see Nilo Couré here. I see Catherine Benamo, longtime friends. I see that Kathy Garrett is also here, whom I haven't seen for a long time. Uh, Juana Suarez is here, Cornelius Moore, who is also a longtime friend. So I'm happy that everyone is here. And I'm actually very, very happy uh, to be here. And I would like to start this by saying, uh, talking about the pleasure I have had throughout all these months, especially last year, during the, the highest point of the pandemic, uh, working with Ruby Rich and then Rebecca Prime, I think has been the highlight of last year, especially in the middle of the pandemic. And for sure, it was one way of keeping me alive and keeping uh, energetic, uh, especially 
in a time uh, where destruction was on the way, uh, the weakening of Brazilian institutions, education, health, as we know now, uh, culture, cinema, of course. But uh, the idea that was behind this came already even before 2019. Uh, by night, uh, 2018 and 2019, we saw an explosion of Brazilian films, a number of Brazilian films being made and being released yearly in Brazil and being present in film festivals around the world. For example, last year, already within Bolsonarismo, at the Berlinale, we had uh, 100, uh, we had 19 films competing in different sections of the uh, of the festival. And that brought this idea that within the past few years, we have seen, let's say, a kind of explosion of Brazilian film. Uh, and the idea for this curatorial work was to get away from the axis of Rio Sao Paulo and look into this immense country and see, let's say, two aspects that came to the, uh, the preparation of this series, of this uh, dossier. One was the idea of a geographical expansion outside Rio and Sao Paulo, a new geography of Brazil, audiovisual Brazil being present, and with it, a new generation of filmmakers, men, women, transgender, native Brazilian population, uh, black cinema, black filmmakers, uh, and themes, and together with them, with, with, with this new generation came an array of new themes. So that was the idea that, uh, uh, that ignited, for example, this discussion of preparing the dossier. Uh, the themes, the filmmakers will be talked along this time here, but I would just like to finish this brief presentation, but like as we are beginning this webinar, uh, I would like to say that we are in a moment where Brazil has recorded yesterday, January 21st. Uh, I have a, the number here. We have more than 214,000 virus deaths and rapidly approaching the figure of 9 million patients infected by COVID. It's the second highest tally uh, in the world behind the US. And with the news that now in the state of Pará, in the Amazon region, some hospitals are also running out of ox oxygen, repeating the same dramatic situation of last week in Manaus, the state capital of Amazonas. So it's a time when we, when we Brazilian citizens are still waiting for details on how and when a mass vaccination mass immunization plan will begin. This situation, added by the fact that now, finally, Trump is gone, hopefully may ignite a momentum. This is the momentum for the increasing pressure for the approval of an impeachment process against our president based on his genocidal politics towards the virus. Uh, Anyway, moving directly to a more constructive momentum and celebration of this very special issue of Film Quarterly, uh, I would like to come back, if we have time at the end, uh, if time allows, to the current situation of the Cinemateca Brasileira, which actually opens both Ruby Rich and myself's introduction to the dossier. So I'll turn back again. I think I did my time and I'd like to give the, the, the floor back to, uh, to Ruby. Okay, Joao, you've been very disciplined. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, it's my great pleasure now then to, to start off the panel with Janaina Oliveira, um, the very influential critic and curator who has written for us, uh, especially on Zojimo Bulbul and that history and on the rise of uh, film festivals uh, in Brazil, as well as the uh, COVID short uh, Republica. But I know today she is speaking in different directions, so I'm not gonna try to guess what that will be. It's always a pleasure. Janaina, the, the screen is yours. Thank you. Hi. Hi, everyone. 
Um, I'm just, I just want to start by saying thank you to Ruby and Joelle for inviting me to be part of this amazing group of authors. I feel deeply honored to be here. Uh, also want to thank Rebecca, Mark, and also Christine and Jack and everybody involved in putting not only this webinar, but all the dossier and all the patience and love that I received through those hard months, as Juan says. It was, you know, really good to be, you know, in dialogue with you all during this pandemic time. Thank you all for being here watching. I see many friends and colleagues here. I won't name them, but you know, hi everyone. See your names make me nervous now, but that's okay. So um, I'm gonna try to be like Joelle and um, you know, and be on time to think. So I'm gonna just say a little, you know, small words about my piece. Um, so my piece is about um, some possibilities, explore some possibilities of thinking about contemporary Brazilian cinema focusing on the innovative uh, presence of black makers in this scenario, the so-called black Brazilian cinema. So briefly, I would like to highlight some of my concerns and intention with those notes. I don't know if uh, people had the opportunity to see the piece, but I made, you know, in a format of notes. So there are five notes on, on what's going on in terms of black Brazilian cinema now. But for me, the first thing I wanted to, to highlight, and that's something very precious and important to me, is to kind of make a historical, an important historical remark considering the beginning of the contemporary movement and the relevance of Zosie Mububu's work to everything that's going on now, uh, not only in terms of Black Brazilian cinema, but for Brazilian cinema in general. And um, and this, I'm saying that this is important because I'm, I'm I was or maybe I am still am tired of this insistent colonial approach of some Brazilian film scholars of setting the origins of Black Brazilian cinema outside of Brazilian experiences. So just to be clear, Black Brazilian cinema doesn't start in Cinema Novo. We can talk about that later. <laughs> because um, uh, we have no debt to pay. So in fact, as Denise Ferreira da Silva says, uh, whiteness or the Western world, in fact, is the one that has an impayable debt with us. So this is one, one point. Another thing that was, that I was somehow trying to dialogue and bring to the table to discussion is also to, uh, try to push the discussion on Black Brazilian films more through aesthetics or more to the films themselves than to the context. Uh, usually or traditionally, somehow, Black film studies and Black film studies in Brazil takes a, a lot of time talking about the context, which of course it's important, but also I want to talk more about the films. So this is one point. Somehow I would like to collaborate to dissolve this traditional dichotomy between context, that means politics and aesthetics, as a traditional sniffleia usually does. And doing so, uh, I try to mobilize another set of concepts and thoughts, what somehow who, those who have seen me speaking somewhere else, I call the epistemological displacement that I believe is needed to deal, the image with the ima to deal with the images uh, I'm interested in. So for example, that's how and why I mobilize uh, Edouard Glisson ideas of opacity, Michael Gillespie's uh, concept of film blackness, Tina Camp's practice of refusal, just to quote some people outside of Brazil. But also I could uh, mention the relevance of my colleagues' uh, works and like Tatiana Carvalho Costa, when she talks about Quilombo cinema, bring to the table the reflections of Leda Maria Martins and A Spiral of Time. Also, Kenya Freitas, when uh, she, her precious uh, thoughts on Afrofuturism, uh, Jota Mombasa, or Denise Ferreira da Silva, that I've already mentioned. Uh, and uh, all, and, and also this is important for me to say that all the notes that are there, they are part of a larger work that I've been developed for the last uh, 10 years. 
that's also uh, connected to my practice as a programmer and a creator. I did four minutes and 50 seconds. That's it for now. Thank you. Great. <laughs> uh, now I'm back here uh, to introduce Fabio, Fabio Andrade. Uh, and it's funny that it's interesting that uh, Fabio, Marcelo, who will come afterwards, and then Tatiana, who will also come here, they are three very young, I would say young, film critics from the same generation. Uh, they are part of this new generation of film critics working mainly online in publications such as Cinetica, uh, in which Fabio is directly involved and of which he is one of the founding members. Uh, and also uh, Fabio uh, writes for a wide range of other venues, such as, for example, Filmmaker Magazine, and also sites like the uh, Criterion Collection, Kino Lorbe, film festivals such as the Berlinale, we've mentioned here before, among others. Uh, Fabio has also taught at Columbia and at NYU, but he's presently in Rio which I knew the other day, doing research on the life and work of none other than Brazilian master filmmaker, documentarist, Eduardo Coutinho, who had received already a dossier in Film Quarterly some years ago, not long ago. Uh, this, this research is being prepared for a PhD dissertation, uh, to be presented, which is in progress, to be presented uh, at the Department of Cinema Studies at NYU and supervised by Professor Robert Stump. So Fabio, I think I did your introduction. Now it's up to you. <laughs> Thank you, João. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I wanna you know, give a shout out to everybody at Film Quarterly for treating us so well during this uh, this issue, the making of this issue, and uh, having such a generous look on Brazilian cinema throughout the years. Uh, I also want to give a shout out to all my friends and mentors and people that I uh, admire who are here on, on the chat. So I don't want to name everybody specifically, but you know who you are. And I also want to uh, point out the, the great coincidence that this is happening uh, at the same day that the the new Mostra de Tiradentes is starting. Uh, it's a very important festival for this uh, specific generation of Brazilian filmmakers that we're talking about. And it's starting today, tonight, actually, with uh, a very interesting retrospective of Paula Gaetan's work. And many of the films will be available with English subtitles. So I encourage everybody to check that out because it's very connected to what we're discussing in this dossier. Uh, I wanted to, I think it's interesting that João introduced me as a critic because I, I would introduce myself the same way. And my approach to Brazilian cinema is precisely that. I've always written about all types of cinema and cinema coming from many different parts of the world. And my, uh, I've, I've been personally invested in Brazilian cinema for natural reasons, but I've become especially enthusiastic about this cinema that started being made here, especially since 2014 in the past, six or seven years, I think, uh, as I, I follow many of the film festivals in New York where I lived for most of the past uh, six years. And I, I, I always had the impression that we had something very interesting going on here that was still underrepresented, under acknowledged. And if anything, the drive behind my work is to actually say that, you know, curators, critics, and cinephiles out there, you're missing out. You should start paying more attention because there's a uh, phenomenal work that actually challenges so many of, I think, the, the shortcomings of film theory and of film history today. And I decided to join a sort of conversation with my piece about one of those aspects, which is this idea of the hybrid film. Uh, and I was, I was basically making a point that this specificity of the Brazilian experience uh, makes that term extra complicated. So I did a presentation on this on this topic at the NYU student conference last year, which was going to be my STMS presentation as well, had it not been canceled. And I remember that I said that I was going to defend hybridity of the term the hybrid film, because I felt that the hybrid film was in a way a contradiction to the very idea of hybridity and that the taxonomy was actually policing us from 
coming up with more specific terms that respected and honor uh, what was uh, specific about these films. Uh, so I, I chose two films and it's already, uh, I think that the choice of objects itself is already uh, a testament of that uh, disconnection that, that exists when you don't consider the specificities of, because these two films are what we in Brazil call metragens. they're medium length films. And that's a language that's not even used in most parts of the world when talking about films of, that run between 15 minutes and 60, for example, which is the case of both. And they both have these very specific strategies of uh, combining elements of fiction and documentary that, that I, I use Caetano Veloso to, to uh, describe why I think that idea of a combination is inaccurate for Brazil because uh, Caetano has a song where he says that here everything was in construction, it's already in ruins. And that's kind of how I perceive boundaries. And I was very uh, uh, interested, I was very uh, happy to read the great interview that Patricia Ferreira gave to the dossier where she talks about that, how boundaries is not something that she, she acknowledges as a Guadagni filmmaker, but she works with it. Uh, so so I'm, I'm, I'm working in this, I think in a similar way that she, she is in her practice. And um, I wanted to sort of bring uh, one sequence of one of the films just to you know, give them proper credit. One, one of them is uh, Seven Years in May by Alf Afonso Shoa, filmmaker from Contagem in Minas Gerais. And the other one is Hawaii Viverá, The Land of the Night Lightning People, which is a film made by a collective of Guarani Kaiwava filmmakers. And uh, the scenes, I, I address the sequence in the text. So I'm just gonna briefly explain. It is very much a confession, uh, a sort of a confessional sequence where Rafael de Santos, who is the, the main character playing himself talks about the, the, the time that he was framed and incarcerated by the police in Minas Gerais. And the scene is shot on a 17 minute long continuous take. And, and it is very much a talking headshot. And after those 17 minutes, something really extraordinary happens, which is the film cuts to a reverse shot of a character that we have not seen up until that point, reframing that documentary scene as a, as a fictional construction, right? And you can see in that photo and also in the second photo that, that Afonso sent me of the making of the film, that they do have scripts, that it, it is, everything was based on the account that Rafael gave of his experience, but it ended up evolving into a, a sort of scripted text and that Rafael himself was very invested in, uh, in making this, uh, as close to something that would feel like a film as possible. And just to wrap on, a, on a, the very last image that I had, the sequence that is uninterrupted in the film, which is seven minutes long, Afonso told me that he shot this over 30 times in different locations. And here we have one image of Rafael de Santos watching the same sequence shot on a daytime scene uh, that is the same that is analyzed in the text. So I just wanna give that as a brief preview of the, of the article and happy to discuss uh, further after we move through the, the menu for today. Thank you. Great. Well, okay. Uh, now we pass, to, uh, we pass on to Marcelo Iqueda, um, who is, whose activities range from teaching to writing to curating and filmmaking as well. Uh, Marcelo teaches at the Film and Audiovisual Department of the Federal University of Ceará, that's in the Brazilian Northeast, uh, and has worked during eight years. And this is inter interesting to note this time frame. That's from 2002 up to 2010, eight years, uh, for the governmental Brazilian agency, film agency, which is the Ancini who is mentioned in a lot in our introductory text to the dossier. Uh, and that was that period was during Lula's presidency. Uh, Marcelo has already written, listen to this, 10 books, 10, um, dedicated to contemporary Brazilian cinema with an emphasis on independent cinema as displayed in the title of one of his most recent books which is called Cinema de Garagem, uh, translated easily as Garage Cinema. It's a new concept that was coined by Marcelo. He is about 
to defend his PhD dissertation next month, titled From the Garages to the World, From the Garage, Garages to the World, Movements of Recognition of Brazilian Cinema in this Century, under the supervision of Professor Angela Priston. And that's at the Univer Federal University of Pernambuco, also in the Brazilian Northeast. So, Marcelo, you are on the screen. Uh, thank you very much to Professor John Luis Vieira for introducing me in such a generous way. <laughs> and uh, I'm very glad to be here with this incredible team of film critics and scholars. Uh, so, uh, Thank you, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. And it, it's always difficult to express myself in a foreign language, English is not my native language, but I, I think I can express myself and I hope you can understand what I'm, I'm trying to say. And I, I would like to, to say a special hello to, to US, to the American audience, because uh, you have a, a new president and unfortunately, we in Brazil, we, we, <laughs> we cannot say the same. <laughs> so uh, congratulations to, to, to US. And uh, I, I think John Luis and, and Fabio Andrade, they said some, some topics I, I, mm. I planned to speak. Uh, John Luis about Garage Cinema. That is a, a, a book I, I, I wrote with Delani Lima that is also a film curator in, in Brazil, that we, th this book was written in uh, 2011. And then we, we analyzed uh, a, a new generation of filmmakers that, that was arising in Brazilian cinema that made a, 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 a new mo modes of, of scene and new modes of shooting. And I think the scene, uh, digital cinema uh, the digital is very important to 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 the de to the democratization of shooting in Brazil. So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, beginning with cin digital cinema, the impacts of digital cinema, we tried to analyze how uh, in all places in Brazil. So, João Luiz Vieira talked about the the axis in Rio, São Paulo, the the main uh, economic center cities in Brazil. So now it's possible to, to see films from all over the, 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 the states, the cities in Brazil. Brazil is a continental country, is a very diverse country. So it's very important that all regions can uh, have the, the means to express their visions uh, into cinematic language. So it's garage cinema and it's very important uh, and uh, also a new generation of film critics and film festivals that made these new films that could be seen because films were made, but you know that it's very difficult that these this new films can be seen and dis discussed. So Fabio Andrade, uh, Tatiana Monassa wrote uh, in, in a Contra Campo and Cinetica to uh, websites to film critic magazines on the internet that were very important to, to, to express our ways of seeing the transformations of contemporary cinema, including Brazilian cinema. And there are a whole, uh, a, a whole network of film festivals like Tiradentes Film Festival and uh, Semana dos Realizadores, Janela Internacional de Cinema. There are a network of film festivals that stimulated discussions about this this new Brazilian cinema. Um, well, I, I just, the, the, the article, my contribution in this dossier was a, about Bacurau. That is in some way a different film, a kind of a different film than the other ones uh, an, analyzed in the dossier because Bacurau is a much talked uh, film. Uh, uh, Bacurau in a, in a uh, it's interesting to talk about Bacurau, not, not only because it's a, a great film and very well made, very well crafted, but especially because th this is a kind of film that encourages um, different types and, and levels of debate. And 
in, in my article, it's interesting because in this dossier, there are free texts, free articles about Bacurau. So it's a mini dossier inside the dossier about Bacurau. And I think it, it's very interesting because uh, uh, it's a, a very interesting when we have different texts, articles about the same film, because I think the articles complement them, themselves uh, to analyze different aspects of, of this film. And in my article, I, I, I try to, to express a point of view that Bacurau presents a kind of a, a certain balance uh, between reflection and spectacle, uh, between uh, art or inter entertainment. Uh, so uh, I start with these antinomies né, to try to, in fact, to try to overcome them, né, suggesting that Bacurau is both. So instead of, of, of dealing with opposite concepts, né, I try to use this at first, but to conclude, to suggest that Bacurau is both. Né, it's, it's reflection and spectacle. It is a political film and a commercial product at the same time. It is both. Né? It, uh, Bacurau is unden undeniable uh, uh, commercial. It's undeniable the commercial success of Bacurau in, in Brazil. That is very interesting because it was distributed not by a major, a big distributor uh, company, but by Vitrine, that is an independent distributor. But Bacurau was a huge commercial success in Brazil, but it was also a commercial success all over the world. And probably Bacurau will will be nominated to the Oscar. So uh, Cannes Film Festival and probably the, the, the main categories of the, the, the Oscar now in Oscar. So uh, we see that uh, how Bacurau is a, is a com commercial success. Marcelo, we'll have time to talk about this after. I, I apologize for cutting you off, okay. but um, we'll get back to this because I think there'll be a lot of interest in Bacurau. So okay, my apology you. for interrupting you. Joao, uh, do you want to go ahead to introduce Tatiana? Okay. Um, well, uh, we saw, we had here Fabio, who is writing his dissertation. Uh, Marcelo, who is about to defend his PhD dissertation in a month from now. And we have Tatiana now here, who just defended on, on December 14th, her dissertation at the University of Sorbonne Nouvelle in Paris. So this is a sign again of this new generation, the kind of thing that we were looking for. You do, the three of you, and also Janaina and others, represent here this new blood, this new input of Brazilian film criticism. Tatiana has been living in Paris for many years now. Uh, she is Brazilian, but she has been living in Paris. Actually, she was born in Paris, right? Uh, right. Where she teaches film at the Sorbonne Nouvelle, and just received, as I said, her PhD in film studies, where she presented a brilliant, really, a brilliant 543-page dissertation whose title is L'effet caméra, essai sur le cadre mobile comme perception technique. Uh, I will translate as the camera effect, essay on the moving frame as technical perception of which I was very, very proud to be a member of the doctoral committee with the sup supervision of Professor Francois Thomas of the Sorbonne Nouvelle. Uh, Tatiana has also written, uh, like the other two I've just presented, uh, on these online magazines. Uh, the first one, Contra Campo, who unfortunately doesn't exist anymore, was discontinued, but also Cinetica, who is very active. And, <clears throat> Sorry, among other publications. And she has been working also uh, from time to time uh, as curator and presenting, especially presenting Brazilian, presenting and discussing 
Brazilian films at the very prestigious Cinémathèque Française. Tatiana, for you. Thank you very much, João. Um, and thank you, Ruby, as well, and all the from Quartery crew uh, for putting this up and for working uh, in the dossier. And so I'm, I'm the real pleasure to be here and I see many friends um, from France and Brazil uh, who are attending. Um, so hi everyone. Uh, I'd just like to start by uh, correcting you, Joan, if I may. Um, I never get to got to, to write to Cinetica. Uh, I may in the future, oh. but uh, not until now. So to start with, I'm going to talk about how we, um, Natalia Brizuela and myself, concocted our piece in the in the dossier, uh, which is uh, which has an analytical introduction and a set of interviews. So the set of interviews was the main main thing, uh, of course. So we started out with the idea of uh, assessing the expansion of film representation and Brazilian cinema and making it, uh, try to make it tangible and visible through uh, first person accounts. So we, we slowly went from um, the initial proposal, uh, which was to produce interviews uh, in, the, in the form of conversation uh, conversations uh, to another format uh, that seemed more appropriate to us in our point of view, and this for several reasons, uh, both uh, practical and intellectual. Uh, so in lieu of a conversation, we came out with the idea of conducting um, each of our interviewees in, in the making of a sort of statement uh, that would cover uh, a series of crucial points. So we set out the points and, and wrote questions that are sent, uh, a block of questions that are sent uh, to, to them. So this was an attempt to draw a portrait of them in first person, just uh, like their filmmaking is. Uh, so I'd say there is a sort of reflexive endeavor uh, in which the form of the interviews reflects uh, its content, their content, or uh, to be more precise, the practice of the interviewees uh, th themselves. In writing the questions we sent them and then editing the text, uh, we tried to find a way uh, to make these uh, portraits uh, consistent in themselves. And at the same time, uh, similar enough in structure, so we could confront them for similarities and differences. So um, it seems to me that the underlining of this piece, of our piece, um, and of much of the dossier, is the idea of the of unity in plurality. I think that's an idea that we find also in the introduction of, of the dossier, which is a very good introduction very good text. So what the filmmakers we interviewed uh, have in common uh, is the fact that they make images out of their particularities and the uniqueness. So with this in mind, we chose the names of the filmmakers we wanted to portray. Um, looking for, uh, so we made, we made this choice looking for intersections between uh, so-called marginal identities that gain access to representation and a stimulant body of work in terms of film language and expression. And we came with um, Patricia Ferreira, Parai Chapi, which, who is an indigenous woman um, from the south of Brazil, uh, and then Julia Catarini, a trans woman of Japanese ancestry uh, from Sao Paulo, uh, Andre, Andre Novaes Oliveira, a black man from Minas Gerais, and then uh, Philippe Matzenbacher and Marcio Reolon, uh, two queer men from the South. So what makes this uh, access to representation uh, so powerful beyond uh, its obvious uh, sociological and historical importance uh, is that it comes across through uh, new and exciting forms of filmmaking and a very personal approach to film creation 
in which the filmmakers uh, own bodies have a central uh, role. So um, we can discuss further into the details of the, their films um, in the Q&A. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Tatiana, for that introduction uh, to, to this great contribution that you and Natalia Brizuela have put together. Um, and uh, some of those films are indeed um, uh, being presented at BMPFA, um, and particularly Julia Catherine and uh, Patricio. Um, I'd like to introduce Livia Perez, great pleasure for me, who is a scholar and a filmmaker, uh, now studying the history of women filmmakers in Brazil and in exile, and um, working herself as a documentary filmmaker too, and a producer of documentary, including, if there are any Academy voters out there, uh, the short documentary that she just produced, Carne, by Camilla Cater, that is now up as a New York Times op doc. Um, so with that, uh, Livia has written on three books. She's done a, a, a review for us for the first time in our history, at least our modern history at Film Quarterly. We have published a review of books that have not yet been translated into English in the hope that we will shame some American publisher and they will be published. So Livia, uh, the screen is yours. Hi everyone, I'm very happy to be here. It's a great honor to be part of this issue here representing book reviews. And uh, I want to thank Ruby and Joel for uh, organizing this dossier in a moment when administration is growing more repressive with cinema and culture in Brazil. It's very important to make us visible in the world. And also I want to thank Ruby and Carla Marcantonio for the willingness to, <laughs> to publish a book reveal about these three books that have not been yet translated to English. And also I must say, I'm very proud to have uh, contributed with a review on these three books because I believe these three books are essential books to approach to a new Brazilian cinema regarding commitments to diversity, equity, and uh, true inclusion. And uh, these books are Feminino e Plural, Female and Plural, edited by Carla Holanda and Marina Tedesco, Mulheres Atrás das Câmeras, Women Behind the Camera, edited by Luisa Luz Varga and Camila Vieira da Silva, and Mulheres de Cinema, Women of Cinema, edited by Carla Holanda. And I really want to say their names here because uh, when I started my PhD on focus on Brazilian women filmmaker, none of these books had been released. So they became a great reference to me. And I, I'm now finishing my PhD. I'm a PhD candidate. So it's very, they, they are very important to me because they constitute, I believe, I knew a new starting point uh, for a gender and feminist perspective for film studies in Brazil. And these books are not only important to me, but for the whole field. Because shocking, there have been no books published on the subject since the end of the eight. We have many articles and papers, but we, don't, we didn't have books before. And uh, can you imagine it 30 years of silence, almost 30 years of silence, despite the boom of women filmmakers in 90s and 20s. So it's a very shocking and uh, that's why I'm very happy to, to contribute with this review. And luckily these collections, they accomplish to filling a concrete historical gap, but also shedding light light upon women filmmakers, offering new theore theoretical directions and uh, make visible also new female directors such as black women and uh, indigenous women also. And um, we can find discussions addressing notion of authorship, updating theories that are using a lot in Brazil and approaches and another aspect I want to highlight is that these books allowed multiple voices to contribute collectively. 
So uh, this uh, book's making the participation of women, of authors in Brazil, of scholars, in female scholars mostly in Brazil to make our cinema visible. And, uh, and I think this is uh, something that is similar to the dossier. So I invited you all to check it out the dossiers and, and also these three books uh, that I reviewed. And um, we can discuss more details in the Q&A and you can check more details in the review that is available for everyone now until March 7. Thank you. Great, great. Thank you so much, Livia. Uh, so now we have time to speak with one another and then eventually we'll take up some of these questions from the audience. But if I can um, put uh, Janaina on the spot, um, I'm going to start with you since we it's been the longest since we've heard from you, Janaina, uh, today. And because you've been doing this work for such a long time on these films in an international context, from your work in Flaherty to your work with Rotterdam, and um, I'm just curious to hear your perspective on this moment and what everyone has been saying, um, what, what Joao and I tried to reflect in the dossier. Like, what, what do you think is really crucial for people to be aware of in this moment um, from your point of view and from especially from studying this kind of quilombo of the festivals that gave rise to this explosive creation. I'm curious to hear more from you about that. You have to unmute. Now it is. Yeah. Um, thank you for, for your your comment. I just want to, you know, remark that Juan has made me feel very old when he was mentioning that everybody's defending their PhD. <laughs> I defended mine in 2006. So thank you, Juan, for counting on that this afternoon. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but now um, I'm being more like, you know, talking about the reality that's not so shiny and happy. I think you, you and Joao made uh, very important remarks and throwing lights to the current situation in Brazil, Brazilian film, and not only film, but culture situation, because also the cinematic um, problem is, you know, the same package. Um, but I think, you know, I'm not definitely not the person that, you know, used to think this, oh, you need to take out something good out of the bag. This is not mine. I don't think we didn't, we needed anything that we're living from Bolsonaro to pandemics to realize that we could do better in the world. <laughs> so this is definitely not my point. But also, I believe that somehow these moments in some thinking about, particularly about our film history in Brazil, there's also an opportunity to change some paths and to reflect more deeply and profoundly and maybe sincerely of, you know, our situation. Uh, because uh, I think, you know, I don't know if most people that are watching us know uh, that um, Brazilian films are made majority with public funds so and um, that means that you know five 55 percent of black people contributing to films are black for example and historically we are outside of this mainstream circuit of film production even though if you go, look back to the national agency of cinema politics it's extremely you know hard it to access funds. From 2006 to 2016, there was a brief moment of, you know, a real, a more flexible thought about who's accessing the funds, trying to change things, but that was a brief moment, including affirmative actions in terms of uh, cinema that of course ended by 2018, but ended really before that. So, you know, just not to put, you know, everything in the current situation for you to have a larger picture of how inequalities in terms of cinema is part of our history. Um, I'm saying that because recently, I've, um, maybe 2019, I participated in some 
conversations on film market uh, festivals and people were very, you know, inflamed about the crisis and everything that we're living in as it was the end of the world. But in fact, maybe this is an end of part of a world, a world of privilege maybe. So somehow, you know, I'm repeat, I'm not the person, let's take something good after bad, not, we didn't need that. But also let's take this chance to think about, you know, the real situation of how um, our problem is not that we are not, everybody is not in the same line when you talk about not accessing funds. I think those who are more affected now were those that always got the money, for example, in terms of public um, funds. So this is also opportunity maybe to start over being optimistic or if not to start over to have more um, open and serious and honest conversations about diversity and um, about who is in the process. I think the film festivals, the main film festivals that were mentioned here, uh, somehow they are aware of the current situation and somehow you can, you can see that reflecting on their programs. Um, so I don't know, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but that's what I, I was just trying to throw some lights about, you know, um, I had this, you know, quote in this discussion that I mentioned in the Market Film Festival that I would love to say that Bakurao is here, but it's not. We are not on the same page when you come to talk about uh, making films and who access films. So and start to, you know, to fight together, we really at first recognize who is um, where in this um, chain. Uh -huh. Me, 2021. Right, a provocation, a provocation. <laughs> yeah. Good, good. Um, I'm curious to hear from some of the rest of you if you want to engage with uh, Janaina's invitation to rethink this moment, um, how you see it, if you're in agreement, if you have a different um, perspective. Yeah, Tatiana. No, I'd li just like to say that um, it's very interesting uh, wh what you say, Janaina, about funding is because uh, one of the things that um, was not surprising, but very strong for me in our interviews was Patricia uh, saying this, that uh, for indigenous people, it was always very hard to get funding, and even during the Lula uh, governance. So uh, for them, uh, of course, it got worse, worse, but um, it didn't change much. Uh, so, uh, so that was really something very strong for me uh, to, to to read, um, and it's just like what what you're saying. So, yes, I think that we can just use this time uh, to reflect more profoundly about uh, diversity, what it really means. Uh, and another thing she says is that uh, not only, uh, it's not only difficult for them to get the, the money, but also that the, 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 the whole, uh, whole um, bureaucracy of uh, applying for funds uh, is not made for indigenous people because they don't, don't get them uh, into consideration or their practical uh, means. So yes, uh, th this, I, I think there's something there like not only for uh, black cinema, but also for indigenous and uh, all, all non-white um, people that want to make films. Non-white, no male, no cisgender person. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I just, I just, uh, um, yeah, no, it's just that. I, oh, I remember now. It's just that we are talking about New Brazilian cinema. So I think this is an opportunity. That was my provocation to think what is really new about it. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But this is important, I think, to interrogate these structures uh, in terms of who is invited in and who is shut out and what kind of work then can result from these structures when already from the beginning there are these blockages and these impediments. So it's easy to use words like inclusion, but mm -hmm. you know, what does this mean, you know? So I think this is very important to, to dial it back to this minute of conception, which is the moment of creation, which then depends on being able in most cases to get funding 
Um, I think right. this is also interesting now with some of this new work being done under COVID with the most primitive digital equipment. Uh, what kind of ruptures will we see from that? What kind of ruptures will this moment then um, introduce that then may open gates more broadly, more widely, um, with less exclusion, less mm. obvious exclusion anyway? Right. The, not, not to mention the exclusion of who has bandwidth, who has Wi-Fi, who has a computer, et cetera. <laughs> Uh, uh, I'd like to ask a question uh, dealing with what we have just said. Um, I was also, I would like to think to, especially having, for example, Tatiana, Janaina, Fabio, uh, and also Ruby, because we are talk, talking about Pacific Film Archive. And I was it, trying to think what would be on the other side, what are the expectations? Uh, related to Brazilian cinema now, for example. And when I mention those names here, I'm thinking about people that have been working with the Pacific Film Archive, the Cinematheque Francaise, Tatiana, the Lincoln Center, Fabio has done a work, a curatorial work there, uh, Janaina also in Rotterdam and other festivals, because I have, the, well, well, we know that Cinema Nova belongs to an era and people, like young people, probably don't have this reference anymore. So what's being expected from, is there a new audience, for example, in your relationship with those curatorial works? Is there a kind of expectation to what a, a, a new Brazilian cinema could bring? This is like a kind of general questions to other people here as well. It's not directed to any of you, but... I think no, Fabio, Fabio. Uh, no, I think that's, a, that's an excellent point, João, because, you know, even if we think of Cinema Novo, right, the reference that we all have of Brazilian cinema, when we start, start engaging with it, and if we think that most of Glauber Rocha's work is still very hard to access in Brazil, let alone outside of Brazil with English subs, you know, and I'm talking about Glauber Rocha, right, I'm, I'm right. still... I'm talking about, you know, Claro is still a very hard to watch film if you want to watch it. It's still very hard to access, right? Cancer, still very hard to access. So, so I do think that it's, uh, there's a, it's, it's sad, it's a sad coincidence that we are also discussing the Cinemateca Brasileira here because there is the serious problem of access to the history of Brazilian cinema, which includes uh, also a diversity of filmmakers yet to be discovered and to be reappraised. Uh, and you know, many of the first films made by black filmmakers in Brazil are barely known. Uh, and, uh, and I think that that goes just as an example of how much they're still left to uncover. And I think that internationally, there, I, I, I sense a lot of interest, but, but not a lot there, there hasn't been yet a, a new work that's organizing this production for an international audience. And I think that as film critics, I think that's one duty that we have, especially in a moment of uh, uh, destruction of these structures, right. because if we don't write about these films, if you don't think about them seriously, if we don't take their aesthetic propositions, their formal propositions, their political propositions seriously, we're gonna let them die to deaths. And part of my, uh, my agenda as a film critic is to try to think about what happened in the past 20 years, which is something that I followed as a critic because I was there writing about these films. What cinema was this? What, what was it suggesting? What, what could we learn from it? And how can we organize this in a way that we can perhaps uh, expand a little bit the idea of the canon of Brazilian cinema? Anyone want to follow that? Yeah. yeah. Can I join? Yeah, please. Um, first, Fabio, I'm going to pull out myself of those who are not doing this because I like to believe that I'm doing this <laughs> <laughs> internationally. Yes. But, you know, this is just me and my perception I think of so. <laughs> I think so. what I've been doing. Uh, do you want to ask about expectation? I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I can't tell you about, you know, international expectation, but I can uh, um, add something about an opening. I think people now I'm talking 
for example, of uh, my experience doing this uh, program in Rotterdam in 2019, when we screened uh, 28 of uh, uh, Brazilian films, black Brazilian films, four feature films and 24 shorts in five programs. And who do, uh, get, got the opportunity to be there? You know, all the, the, the rooms were, were packed and people were very interested in the discussions and the Q&A and the talk program. And after that, many of those films um, got invitations to be uh, in other film festivals and, you know, films start circulating. And I, I have this feeling, not only by the Rotterdam experience, but even if I talk about, for example, the what's going on on with the Zazimububu Black Film Festival, where very important people in terms of the, the film, you know, culture and now in the world, you know, wanted to be there. For example, Terence Nance, he wanted to be there last year. You know, all the filmmakers that we invite, they are always open and wanted to be here. Programmers, they are interested in what is going on. So I can see that I'm talking about this particular experience, but I can feel that in general, by the discussions I've been participating, um, that people are very open and trying to understand how we are making things now, and particularly now in these um, wow. sad times we're living in. Mm -hmm. Good. Good. Does anyone else want to address that? Um, Fabio, before you respond, I would just want to see if Livia or Marcella or Tatiana has something um, to add to this from their experiences. Anyone? Uh, yes, Ruby, I want to add uh, something that Fabio told about the difficult to access Globus Hoshes films, because uh, also when we work with uh, female directors is very, very difficult because the priority in the, in the queue to, to access these films is very, very hard. So, I mean, just to point this, uh, it's not just, you know, Global Hush is difficult, but we have a world around and, and mm -hmm. that is very difficult. Just Great. I want to add something to that, uh, just a little early advertisement for the next issue of Film Quarterly, because it will come out in March, and there will be an article by Patricia Morade Andrade on Helena Ignes, who has been written out of the history of Cinema Novo, thanks to Glaube and his friends. <laughs> so I just want to say that even when we think the most basic building block may be Cinema Novo, it turns out that this is already um, a, a, a missing a piece. So to stay tuned for that next issue. And uh, there's still lots of work to be done on the past as, as well as on the present. So I just wanted to add that in. Um, good, good. Um, we are also getting questions that are beginning to arise from the audience. And I want to put one in that um, has come from uh, Catherine Benamou, who has two questions that we may want to choose from. But just so that you can see it, I've put this out for the panelists and those in attendance. Um, one is about diasporic cinema. So not so much how the rest of the world is seeing Brazilian film right now, but also um, how Brazilian film has been made outside the nation. Um, and also, what about the terminology of new Brazilian cinema that Joao and I concocted? And what is this periodization that we are daring to put forward? And should it actually be post retomada or should it actually be millennial Brazilian cinema? So I'm hoping that one of you may want to take up one of these questions before we go back to our own conversation. Anyone have thoughts about this? And I while you think, can, yeah, I can go on. Again, maybe. Uh, Sorry, Fabio. Yes, Livia, but, go ahead. Livia, then Fabio, then uh, I think Jenny. No, it's just because I, I'm studying Tania Cipriano and uh, Tania is, has a, a situation similar to Norma Bahia Pons, another filmmaker I'm studying, a filmmaker that existed in Cinema Novo and was totally forgotten. And uh, Norma lived, I mean, Norma left Brazil because of the dictatorship, but also because uh, she was a lesbian and she went to New York, she lived there and she started to make 
videos, you know. So uh, there's a, um, how can I say that? But there's a, a displacement in terms of theory, in terms of support, and uh, also in terms of um, geographic. And uh, this is how I understand maybe sometimes there's this kind of things that we, want, we, we need to consider in studying Brazilian history cinema. So just to say something. Yeah, I think these lacunae are very crucial uh, to discover and begin to work with. So thank you for that. Um, mm -hmm. Fabio, you were, you were saying something? Yeah, I was thinking about question number two, and I just wanted to address what Janaina said. I'm not minimizing any of the work we are already doing. I think we need more people to you know, <laughs> help us with it. Uh, we're all here. Uh, so we need more. We need help. Huh? We need more people engaged, more people interested. That's all. But this <laughs> <is> the, <laughs> the second point that I, you know, I think one thing. That, that I thought long and hard about that, that I think the introduction at the dossier really does a wonderful job describing is that it's, it's not really so much a generation or you know, a, a shift, uh, a merely temporal shift. I think there are very specific political, economic, social, cultural conditions that generates the cinema that we are interested in. And this generates specific forms that I think in turn generates a specific politics. So, so I think it's really important to think about the films in conjunction with the conditions that, uh, you know, funding of the digital technology, universities, film criticism, film festival, all of this is a big web of circulation that has generated something that I think is unlike other moments in, in the history of Brazilian cinema. Mm -hmm. I just, I just want to add something on that, that Fabio, you know, said that I completely agree is that, you know, something, a lot of things that we are, of people that we are seeing the work now, you know, they are also related to a certain time in our politics. It's called the Lula and the Dilma era. That has right. to be named. So not that, uh, I'm not talking about perfect times. I'm talking for a historical moment that we have global policies of education and culture that make possible a lot of different people, not only those that were based in Rio and Sao Paulo, for example, to access somehow some kind of um, education and in cinema, education in general, but also in cinema in different formats, not only about uh, university um, uh, education, but you know, different initiatives. We had, for example, um, when Gilberto Gil was Minister of Culture, um, an initiative that's called Pontos de Cultura, you know, that was spread all over the country, you know. And also we had other initiatives when it comes to indigenous cultures like Vigil Nas Aldeias that today you have a generation of filmmakers that are making films in a, in a very, author or independent way, but they had this, you know, during 20 years, the context. So, you know, I, I think it's also interesting to, to frame this context. I'm not saying that we do things, but also we need to name things in order to understand also that what, what we are missing now. Mm -hmm. That's really good. Mm -hmm. Yes, Marcello. I, I just want to compliment that to understand what is new about the cinema, it's important to analyze not just the films, but also the film festivals, film criticism, uh, university, as, as Fabio told. I think it's very important nowadays film history uh, has expanded, expanded its field of action, not just analyzing the films themselves. Of course, the films are very important, but to understand the context, the structure, it's very important to, to understand film, film funding, university, uh, for, for example, this, this location from Rio, Sao Paulo and the Northeast. For example, me, myself, I, I, I was born in Rio and I moved from Rio to Fortaleza to teach at a film university at Ceará. At Fortaleza, there is a small city, a small economic city in Brazil. So there are a lot of movements uh, in Brazil, social, social, mm -hmm. political, economic in, in Brazil that reflects in this this structure of the institutions, film institutions in Brazil. I, I appreciate that. And I have been to Fortaleza, so I know exactly 
what you are talking about. Tatiana, yeah, yeah. you had something you wanted to add, no? Yes, I, I would like to add, um, I totally agree with this um, expansion of the, uh, of the consideration of historical facts and uh, beyond the, the films themselves. Um, but uh, it was also about what uh, Janaina said, uh, because I, I, I think that uh, also about the date, I, I believe you can say it's post retomada, uh, the, the new Brazilian cinema being the novissimo cinema brasileiro in Portuguese, which was a kind of a label that was used a little bit used um, towards the end of, uh, of the of the 2000s, like 2009, 2010, this term uh, started to appear. And I believe uh, also that, uh, yes, you have to name this, uh, this era, um, but it's also this, um, this generation appears uh, after some, some years because they, they're, the, the, they're the result uh, of all this, um, of all this, this new, uh, this new structures uh, mm -hmm. of culture. So it's logical that they, they won't appear uh, when um, Lula uh, takes office. It's like some years after, because it's all, all really the result of, of planting, let's say, um, culture all, all over the country. So yeah, I, I'd say it's post retomade and it starts like in 2009, 2010. Um, Thank you. If you, if you have to, to get yeah. precise in terms of yeah. dates, I would say this. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And I think I, I'll say one thing before I turn over to you, Joao, that I think these are important perspectives, but because I, I think the field of film studies still has this fetishizing of the text that thinks that it lands there on the screen unconnected to anything. And uh, I think it's really crucial to disrupt that kind of dismemberment um, of the process yeah. and right. recognize what it mm -hmm. takes behind the film i always say this film is very strange because there's no i think there's no other medium that so conceals its own process of production that it just disguises and conceals it and then people we stupidly accept what we see as all there is and i think these are wonderful x-ray visions that we are getting here from all of you of what actually lies beyond the frame and behind the frame sorry joao go ahead no, I was just, uh, I'd like to, remi uh, to remember that, to remind us that, as Marcelo said, Universidade Federal do Ceará, that's in the Northeast, another great example of this decentralization, which is featured in our dossier, is, and what goes uh, along with what Tatiana has just said, take some time to have the production to make it visible. And that's the case of the Universidade Federal do Recôncavo da Bahia, which is in Bahia, in the south, of, close to Salvador, but in the countryside of Bahia, and that has been producing. It's, a, again, a whole new generation that has produced at least two, I would say, masterpieces of this new, novíssimo cinema brasileiro, as we may call it, which is, two, they are featured, especially one, which is Ilha, Island, but also uh, Coffee with Cinnamon, Café com Canela, who is also featured in Carla Holanda's text. Uh, these are great examples. The Ilha has received a great analysis from Juliano Gomes in our dossier. Uh, but I also saw that Chris Horak made a question about the uh, archives, and I yes. think it's right somewhere. And I would like to address that also, Ruby. If the, the, what, what time do we have here? We have um, about uh, 20 minutes left and we're just beginning to get to the audience questions. Um, so that's fine. Uh, does anyone though want to address the current theme before we leave to talk about archive? No? Okay, go ahead, Joao. No, it's uh, just to yeah, answer. Yeah, uh, Chris asked about uh, the destruction of the archives now with the, the threats against the uh, cinema text. Right. Uh, hi, Chris. Glad that you are here. I'm very happy to know that you are watching this. But this is just something that's news, some news that came a week ago, exactly on January 15th, that uh, I mean, it's after a, more than a year, as we know, of the archive, especially of Cinemateca Brasileira. This doesn't happen to 
the film archive at the Museum of Modern Art in Rio, which is, doesn't belong to the government, is a private institution. So now it's good, it's okay, because it's not affected by this governmental po uh, destruction policy of Bolsonaro. So the real one is fine, uh, Chris. Uh, it's even expanding during the pandemic its documentation center, moving away from the museum to open up a new documentation center, also in the downtown area of Rio. So that's 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 fine. But as for Cinemateca Brasileira, after more than a year closed, and of course, after mounting pressure uh, on January 15th, which is just a week ago, news came uh, that the former Sociedade Amigos da Cinemateca, which are, we could translate like Friends of the Cinemateca Society, which, which is a non-profit organization created in 1960. Now it's expected to conduct a three-month emergency plan for the reorganization of the archive, including the readmission of employees in order to prepare for the selection of the, uh, uh, that's the question, in order to prepare for the selection of the non-profit organization that will officially take care of the archive. So it's like bureaucracy and postponing decisions. Uh, it is expected that the selection process, it's expected, will naturally favor the friends of the Cinemateca Society, since they are the ones who have the best knowledge and experience to do that job. This process has been delayed, constantly being delayed and delayed. So with this government we have here, no one actually knows, never knows when that plan will actually begin. In terms of priorities, for example, uh, if a vaccine plan is still in the air, what is the importance of film? We ask the government, for example. Uh, the, uh, and then I have a, a response from the Brazilian Association of Audiovisual Preservation that has already expressed its concerns that a three month plan is not sufficient to cover all the damage brought by the lack of maintenance of an archive that's closed now for months the state of its equipment that needs maintenance, not to mention the, amazed, this, the, the state of the amazing collection uh, uh, held by Cinemateca Brasileira with more than 250,000 negatives of Brazilian and foreign films, including nitrate, plus documentation and other materials. So this is the situation right now. It's a big, still, still a big question mark that's being postponed and postponed. Good, very good, thank you. Thank you, Joao. I'm gonna just read out the three questions that have come in through the Q&A uh, because since we don't have too much time left, I want to put all three out there and then we can see who wants to speak to which question, okay? So the first I question- I answered one, just Pardon? to tell you. I had answered one. Oh, like okay. Typing. Okay, very good. Do you want to share it with us, Tatiana? Um, yes, it was a question that what Janine and Tatiana said, I'm reading the question. Yes. Uh, is that the end of public support to cinema production in Brazil in the past few years can be seen as a form of equality as it spreads pre pre precarity all over? I think I didn't get it. Can you explain a bit more? And so huh? I said, um, no, absolutely not. It's just that this new general precarity is an occasion to reflect further about the funding policies and structures so that it get, uh, so that they can get reformed in the future to be more inclusive. And I don't know if Janine has something to say, but this was no, my answer. It's, it's pretty much that, is that, you know, uh, if we are fighting for Ancini, what I think we should fight and we need to fight, for example, that's the National Agents of Cinema. But also we want to, we have to ask what Ancini we are fighting for because this unseen is also the place of inequality. And we can't use the crisis uh, argument just to think that, uh, to pretend that we are not seeing this. You know, it's basically that. So uh, thank you for answering, uh, Tatiana, it's basically that. Very good. 
Very good. Um, there is another question um, that I'm just putting into the chat from Anna Sophie Filippi about where are these new filmmakers coming from? Where are they learning filmmaking? Um, is it coming from film schools? Is it, are they autodidacts? And are they working as collectives? And so looking for some more information about who, who they are. Does anyone want to say anything about that? I think when I, when uh, Fabio and I were address, you know, the broader context about, you know, what is going on, somehow we related mm -hmm. to this uh, question, mm -hmm. you know, um, global mm -hmm. policies of education, mm -hmm. uh, you know, different initiatives in film critics, the festivals, mm -hmm. and I think also this is all related to the new, this new generation. Good. Yeah, I would just add that, you know, it's when we're thinking about Brazilian cinema, we're thinking about, a, this, you know, a continental size production. I think we're now average, averaging between 200 and 300 feature films every year coming out of Brazil. So there is, there are very different conditions depending on what films we are looking at. But I do think that the presence of that web of actors that we have all mentioned here is something that is new and distinctive to this specific historical period. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, I'm going to put post here another question from another Livia, Livia Campos de Menezes. It's, and this is a very funny question. Do you think it's possible to break from government incentives and develop a more mature film industry in Brazil? But I think the government incentives perhaps are breaking from the filmmakers. So what, does anyone want to have any comment on that? <laughs> I think you made it, Ruby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think perhaps it's it's hard to be mature without the without any funding. No, so... we are mature. The government has to be mature. <laughs> we're, we're Bingo. Understanding <laughs> and what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like this. This is really good. And this was the third question that we didn't have here um, about Brazil's exceptionalism. And what, how is it that Latin America doesn't have contact uh, within itself between countries? And this is a long standing issue that goes back to even 16 millimeter film days when people would gather in Havana at the film festival in Cuba and say, why don't we get to see each other's films? And they would all have to go to Havana in the 1980s to see people who were in exile, people who were in the countries, they could not see anything unless they went there. So those, that was a wonderful time because there was this kind of uh, uh, reunification outside of the borders. But what about this? Does anyone have anything they want to say about this? Written by someone who's uh, based in Oaxaca and um, worrying about this fragmentation. I think, I think it is a, a huge problem also related to the size of Brazil, the insularity of being the you know Portuguese colonized country in a major, you know the majority of Latin America being uh, Hispanic uh, colonized, uh, but there are a few uh, important I think initiatives in that regard. There are festivals focused on Latin American cinema as well that would put uh, Brazilian cinema in conversation with that. So there's like Fun in Florianópolis was doing that. Gramado was doing that for uh, for a few years and also Lusophone specific festivals that would connect the productions between Brazil, Portugal, and the Lusophone countries in Africa as well, like Cine Porto, for example. So I think they do exist, uh, but, but yeah, I think it is, there's a lot to do in that area of sort of re-attaching uh, the severed limbs of Latin America in Brazil. I think it's something that we all should be committed to on a daily basis, because we don't do that enough, I think. Right. Great. So I have a question I want to pose to all of you. Um, well, well, I just, okay, let me stop because a question just came in to the chat from Yiman Wang to all of you saying in the light of exclusionary funding infrastructures, do uh, filmmakers seek transnational funding? And if so, what about the transnationalization of Brazilian cinema? So does anybody want to address that? And um, it's a, a good thing to note. Um, is there any, yeah. Um, Can I yes. No, no. Oh, Olivia, go ahead. ahead. Olivia. Let's talk about her experience, Livia. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, uh, as, as producer, but 
I mean, this is the model, the, the model of transnationalization or internationalization is uh, the model that runs in Argentina and Uruguay and other Latin America countries and has been working good because uh, there is no, there was no uh, funding infrastructure that we had in Lula's government. And now I think it's time to do the same movement maybe. I mean, to make more, more uh, alliances, more agreements and, and try to, uh, I mean, to, to get money abroad to make our films. And, uh, and this work, in, for example, with Carinha News, the first films of Carinha News, they were made in this way, like out of Brazil. And, and I mean, women and queer people are always and trying to um, do this time. I don't know about black filmmakers, if Jenna can add something. I think I just want to add this because, you know, what Livia is saying about the mature and things, because I, what I was trying to say when Ruby was mentioning it, it's just like, you know, um, uh, of course, uh, there are initiatives uh, with uh, international funding. Uh, of course, there are filmmakers and film producers that are trying to reach uh, film markets, labs, different funds. But if you put in proportion, who access those instances? Uh, very few people. And if you go straight and sharp and take a sharp look, who is getting those funds? are the same people that are getting the money here. So, you know, so it's when I'm talking about to have a more honest look to the situation, it has to do with that. So, you know, because we can not just uh, say though there are international funds. It's not that easy to access. It's not that, you know, to be international film circuits that's in, you can, you know, reach those people that can fund your film or even participate on live that we know that are going to uh, act or function like a label for you to get another uh, access. So this is not an easy chain to break. And at the same time, the, it's not easy to, to break this historical way of the where cinema in Brazil is funding. So it's not that, you know, easy shift. It was more in that sense, you know, that I was um, my, that my comment, uh, and I do mm -hmm. agree with everything that Lydia just said too. Mm -hmm. And I think what, what to follow up on that, I think that what Joao and I were trying to do with this dossier, hoping to do with this dossier, was at least to break with old views of Brazilian cinema, with old cliched preconceptions of what the Brazilian cinema was based on very outdated it's... ideas, older films, and the pre-Lula, pre-Dilma period of like, you know, I, we don't have to name them, but let's say, for instance, the cinema of the Barretos or the cinema of these other forces that governed funding before mm -hmm. this huge expansion, uh, geographic and, and in terms of, of who what funds were available. So I think this is an important moment to mark. I'm so excited that the dossier is marking it and can begin to help both internationally and also um, to help with um, bringing back to Brazil in this moment of so much threat that there is uh, a recognition of what is so important that is being done there and of the work that you all are doing there. So I know we're coming to the end of our time. I want to give you each a moment if there's a last thing that you would like to say and put into the record and also to remind the audience that this chat is here and the panelists to pay attention because we're getting a lot of interesting uh, points here. But any last thoughts about how can people support important filmmaking now in Brazil? How can people support criticism? that is actually capable of meeting this work on its own terms and not layering old ideas onto it. Um, who should people be paying attention to? Uh, what films, what writers, what do you recommend? And by the way, everyone, these are the writers you should pay attention to in the meantime. <laughs> and um, what, what are the last thoughts? What are, your, what are your words of wisdom to leave people with as we come to the end of our time here? Too short, too short a time. Joao, you're smiling. <laughs> I, I, 
words of wisdom, but I would hate to be the last one to speak. So I'm going to do it right away so someone can okay. speak. Okay. <laughs> But I, but I just wanted one thing that I wanted to point out, you know, this whole thing with the industry and funding is that I do think that what public funding generating, generated in Brazil was uh, actually quite remarkable artistic independence. And, and I don't think that it's complete artistic independence, but I do think that the constraints were way less severe than an industry would bring or, or way less severe than the festival market brings, the lab market brings. So I think that that's what made this this specific cinema so artistically interesting. And I think you know if the corn industry is very good at defending subsidies, I think we should be very good at doing that for cinema as well. Great. Well said. Can I say something? Yes, I wouldn't dare Just stop. Briefly, you know what I would like. <laughs> since we began, I began this in a very sort of gloomy. Uh, uh, climate in a very gloomy feeling, talking about deaths and infected patients, I would just like to really read or rephrase somehow the last lines of our introduction to bring it to a more kind of positive <laughs> way. And then <laughs> this is what is written there for people that haven't read it. In such sobering times, it is more crucial than ever to mark with celebration the visionary power of fresh films and thinking. For resistance and persistence are not only the hallmarks of filmmaking or writing, they are key to the ability to continue to maintain a film culture capable of nourishing a future entirely different from the savage present in which these words have been written. This is it. It's a great <laughs> ending, I think. <laughs> <laughs> good, good, good. Thanks for that, Joao. I was needing that. <laughs> um, yeah, I just, I just want to thank you um, all for being here. And, um, you know, I've been, um, as, a, as a Black person, you know, we've been surviving for 500 years. And I, I know we are going to survive all this. We're gonna survive, um, you know, this guy occupying the presidency. We're gonna, it's gonna be hard and, you know, we're surviving and, you know. And one thing fundamental to survive, I think, is what we're doing here is connecting, is getting together because this, at the very end, we talk about public funds, we talk about everything, but what we have is people. And if, for example, here I had a lot of people watching that are really not only beloved friends, but people that I really can count on work and collaborate. I can name Christopher Harris, Cornelius Moore, Juana, uh, the son, uh, Tatiana, Carol, anything Kenya, and many others here. So uh, that's what I'm into. And thank you so much, Ruby, João, Fabio, Tatiana. Um, Marcelo and all those that work together for this dossier, you know, it, that's what I believe in. That's what made me optimist somehow. I love that. I love that. Any other last word? Who dares to go after Janaina? <laughs> Not me. <laughs> <laughs> any other thoughts? No, but seriously, any other thoughts that you have been wanting to bring forward that you didn't have the chance to say yet? in answer to anything that's come up. Yeah. Take a look at the comments. I see great, great comments, lots of enthusiasm, wonderful audience. And uh, uh, Joss and Luck are talking about the calling out to start using these films and these texts in teaching, help to spread the influence that way. Uh, there's the public, there's the students, there's pedagogy, there's exhibition, there's curating. Uh, production is out of our hands, out of our funds, but supporting the results of that production, that's something that we can all do. And um, I thank you, Joao, for coming to uh, Film Quarterly with the idea way back when and uh, sticking with it and um, guiding me through this landscape. And to all of you and to all of the other contributors to the dossier who are not here on the panel. It's a wonderful dossier. Uh, we've posted 
uh, the website. And if you can't find it, just go to filmquarterly.org. You can find it there. And you can also find the link to the um, Pacific Film Archive uh, program. Um, I want to thank you all. It's been wonderful. Uh, I hope we get to meet again someday in person. And in the meantime, at least some damn Zoom in the future. Uh, okay. Joao, thanks again. Thanks, everyone. Livia, thank Fabio, you, thank Tatiana, you much. Marcelo. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yes. Thank you, Ruby. Anaida. Thank you, Joao. Ciao. Bye. Ciao. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks to our whole Bye. team that you see up here on here. Thanks, everyone, for bringing, making this work and making it look easy. Ciao. Ciao. Ciao.